quantitative graphs to describe uh, situations. So what's a qualitative graph? Uh, so a qualitative graph is a graph without scaling or tick marks uh, and the numbers or numbers on the axis, on the axi, axis, axi. So here's an example. Uh, since 1985, Michael Jordan has endorsed a successful line of shoes called Air Jordans. Uh, let P be the retail price in dollars of Air Jordans and let T be the number of years since 1985. Uh, the qualitative graph displayed uh, here describes the prices of the shoes. What does this graph tell us? Okay. So, we don't have any actual numbers, so, you know, there's, we're a little limited on what we can uh, uh, what we can say. We don't know the actual price, but the fact that it's above this intercept point, right, the, the origin, means that the price was not zero, right? At this point right here, it's something above zero. It cost something back in 1985. And then since then, what's been happening to the price? It's been going up. Can we be more specific on how it's been going up? Increasing. It's been increasing. Can we be more specific on the way it's been increasing? Over time. Over time, it's been increasing. In dollars, yes. Not in penny. Not in uh, nickels or sheep. It's been going up in dollars. Constantly. Constantly at a steady rate. Right? Consistently it's been going up. Uh, what's the fancy math word? Linearly. It's been going up in a linear fashion. Right? So it seems like every single year there's been a steady, consistent increase in the price according to this graph. So that's what we can tell out of the qualitative graph. Good? Yes? Questions, comments, issues? No? Okay. Uh, notice this. This is very, very common in this book. A uh, year since 1985. So we very often describe this uh, horizontal axis by the number of years that have gone by since a particular starting point. So uh, in this case, they chose 1985. That's when the, the, the shoes came out. And so all the little um, values along here represent the number of years since that starting point. Okay, so we use that a lot in this book. So the graph tells us um, that the retail price of insurance has increased steadily and consistent. Uh, a curve is said to be linear uh, if it forms a straight line. The curve is uh, in the previous slides are linear. So uh, the word curve uh, gets people confused a little bit sometimes. Curve means graph. Uh, that's what we we that's the, we use that word to represent graph. And that graph could be linear. So I know you think curve and you think curvy. But a line is a curve. Curve is just a picture, a graph, so it's a curve. Okay. Uh, all right. So assume that an authentic situation can be described by using the variables t and p, uh, and that p depends on t. Then we say that uh, we call t the independent variable, and we call p the dependent variable. Okay. T the independent variable, and p the dependent variable in a case like this. Uh, it's not. There's nothing specific about the letter T and the letter P. Uh, in this book, we interchange letters all the time, so you have to be careful uh, about which one is which. So I know that we are very, very used to seeing what two letters? X and Y, right? Y and X, right? And what would happen if we flip them around and put a Y there and an X there? People freak out, right? What? There's nothing special about the letter X or the letter Y, just because most algebra books, algebra books happen to have that. It stems from uh, equations that tend to have the letters X's and Y's, and you're used to solving for Y and all that. Um, but the, the specific letters X and Y don't really mean anything. Uh, so rather than calling it uh, the X and Y, so typically this is called the X axis, true. Uh, but it's also the horizontal axis. That's a more appropriate title for it. The horizontal axis. 
Um, and it's also the independent variable. So the independent axis, right? It's the independent variable goes here, right? So when you graph something, you get to choose this. So you manipulate this, you make a choice about the independent variable. And then when you make that choice, it determines what happens, what's the answer, the result that comes from choosing a particular value of the independent variable. So in this direction, I know we're used to seeing this, the y-axis, uh, but there's nothing special about the letter y. So uh, a more appropriate one would be the vertical axis. Vertical axis. Um, or the dependent variable axis. Dependent axis. Okay. Good. Questions, comments, issues? Okay, so in a real word problem, we're going to have to learn how to choose which one is the dependent variable and which one is the independent variable. And that can get a little tricky in certain word problems. So we're going to practice doing that next. So for each situation, identify which one is the independent variable and which one is the dependent variable. One of them should make more sense, right? So we're connecting. Uh, a real world situation and trying to apply uh, a mathematical construct to it. So we got to come up with something that makes sense. So the first one says, uh, you're waiting in line to go to a concert. Let T be the number of minutes you must wait. Uh, and let N be the number of people ahead of you when you first get in line. Um, so let's say you're trying to buy tickets. Right, so there's some, some band that's you know, going to have a concert, and you go there, it's first day of ticket sales, and you have to go there physically to get them, I don't know why. Uh, so you get there, and there's a bunch of people in line. When you see a bunch of people in line, you can kind of make some sort of connection as to how long it's going to take you for you to get your tickets, right? You're waiting at the box office, and okay, there's a bunch of people, or there's very few people, so you can make that sort of a judgment. So which sentence makes more sense? The time it takes you to be able to purchase your tickets depends on the number of people ahead of you in line. Okay? Or the other way around, the number of people ahead of you in line depends on how long it takes you to get your tickets. Which of those two sentences makes most sense? First one? First one, right? Like if you're on the phone, which would be an appropriate response, right? Like let's say you're on the phone and the person asks you, how long is it going to take you to get your tickets, man? And you go, well, I don't know, there's like 70 people ahead of me. Is that a, is that a good response? Mm -hmm. that, that's an appropriate conversation? Okay. The other way around, you're on the phone and like, hey, how many people are ahead of you in line? About 13 minutes. <laughs> what? <laughs> how, does, how does that connect, right? So if they ask you how many people are ahead of you in line, it doesn't make sense for you to answer with a time. You know, 25 minutes. What? I don't know. But if they ask you, how long is it going to take you to get your tickets, and your answer is how many people are ahead of you in line, that sort of makes sense. You can kind of judge it, right? How long is it going to take you? There's like 150 people ahead of me. Ooh, okay. That's going to be a long time, I can tell, right? Or, oh, there's only three people ahead of me. Oh, okay. That's going to be quick. All right, all right, okay. So it makes more sense. So the, the uh, time it takes you for you to get your tickets uh, depends on the number of people ahead of you in line. So in a situation like this one, where we would put the T and the N. N there, T there. Yeah. The time it takes depends on the number of people ahead of you in line. Right? So this is uh, what, you know, once we choose this value, once you are told the value of N, then it makes sense to have a corresponding value of time. Good? Okay, so there's, there's one example. Uh, the next one. Let n be the number of times a person can, can lift dumbbells. Lift a, a dumbbell that weighs w pounds. Okay, so we got some sort of a dumbbell right here, and I ask you, you know, you, you want to, uh, the weight of that dumbbell is w, is being represented by w, the variable w. And the number of times you can lift it is represented by the letter N. Okay? So, which sentence makes more sense? Uh, or which conversation makes more sense? If someone says, 
um, hey, how much, how much does that dumbbell weigh? I can lift it 30 times. That, that doesn't, that's not a good response, right? Okay, um, well, uh, what about the other way around? If somebody asks you, how many, how many times can you lift that dumbbell? And your response is, well, how much does it weigh? That's a good conversation, right? Because your answer to how many times can you lift it is going to depend on how heavy is it, right? Hey, how, how, how many times can you guys, you know, pick up this dumbbell? Well, I don't know, it depends. Is it, is it 20 pounds? Is it 100 pounds? So uh, an appropriate prompt or a, a, an appropriate response to how many times can you lift this dumbbell is to ask, what, uh, what is the weight? So, which sentence makes more sense? The number of times you can lift a dumbbell depends on the weight. That's a good sentence, right? That makes sense. The number of times you can lift a dumbbell depends on the weight of the dumbbell. The other way around doesn't make any sense. The weight of the dumbbell depends on how many times you can lift it. That doesn't, that doesn't make much sense. Good? Maybe, yeah? Okay, so as far as this guy, we would put the W there and the N there. Is that the way it goes? No. The weight depends on the number of times. No, the other way around, right? So the number of times that you can lift a dumbbell depends on the weight. Okay. Okay. And then what kind of a qualitative graph would sort of make sense? You can judge me. Make it about me. Um, I'm trying to lift some dumbbell that's on the floor there. What kind of a qualitative graph can I describe? Can I use to describe this? Uh, so, would would that make sense? Is that a good, appropriate qualitative graph? No. Why not? What does that say? In fact, let's throw some color on here. As the weight goes up, lift it more. Right. This qualitative graph here is saying that, first of all, several things are weird about it. First of all, what does this mean right here? This dot right there. It's right there. What is that saying about the relationship between the weight and the number of times that I can lift that dumbbell? When the weight is zero, I can lift it a fixed number of times. Does that make sense? I mean, I don't know what number that is. That might be a big number but it's a fixed number of times, that doesn't make any sense. If something weighs zero, I should be able to lift it how many times? An infinite number of times, right? Perhaps. Mm, an infinite? Really infinite? Meaning, you know, here is this imaginary dumbbell. One, two, three. I can do this an infinite number of times? No, I can't do it an infinite. Eventually, what's going to happen? I'm going to get tired, right? So even if it weighs zero, I mean, I could do this maybe a thousand times, two thousand, I don't know. There's some really big number, but it's not infinite. Okay, so there's that. That's weird about this thing. And then what's the other thing that's weird about this line, the way I drew it? As the weight increases, I, I get stronger the heavier it is. I could do it more and more. When it's, when they, like, if we did throw some numbers on here, when the dumbbell weighs 30 pounds, I can lift it uh, 50 times. But when the dumbbell weighs 70 pounds, somehow I can lift it even more. Now I can lift it 65 times. I'm just getting stronger and stronger. That doesn't, that doesn't make sense. I mean, maybe if you're thinking about a different situation where you're thinking over time, I'm working out, so I'm getting stronger, so maybe in that case. But we're talking about one time right now, I'm judging your, your strength right now. So it would make sense that the heavier it is, the less that you can lift it, right? Okay, so let's get rid of this one and think of a different one. So again, a qualitative graph has no scaling. I just put some numbers on there to make sense of this. Uh, but, okay, so there should be some amount when it's zero, right? If it's a big number, I can do this a lot when there's zero, but it's, uh, it, it's, it's, it's uh, some fixed number, right? Um, you know, if you go to the gym and there's people that lift that, the, the, the big bar and they don't even put any weight on it, I mean, the bar itself has some weight, right? So it almost, it's a little embarrassing, like, oh, I guess I'm lifting a, just the bar by itself. I mean, the bar by itself is like 50 pounds, so... 
that could be heavy. Anyway, uh, what about this? Does this make sense? Yeah. 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 Okay. What about this arrow thing? An arrow means that you go in that direction, mm -hmm. right? You continue that pattern. Does that make sense? Yeah. What is this part down here saying? Yeah. At some point, it's so heavy that I can lift it a negative number of times. How does that work? Like at some point, if it weighs, let's say this guy right here, if it weighs 175 pounds, I can lift it negative three times. How do you lift something negative three times? No. It's how many body parts you break trying to lift it or something, right? Uh, no. So it wouldn't make sense for this to go below zero. In some work problems it makes sense, in some work problems it doesn't. In this case, this better stop somewhere. Okay, so does it make sense that it stops there? Yeah. Okay, there, there is some weight, there is some weight that we reach where we stop being able to lift it. Okay, that makes sense. What about the fact that it's a straight line? Does that make sense? Uh, consistent, routine, right? Because the human body is very consistent and routine that way. Like very, very, like for example, like let's say that this represents uh, 20 pounds and I can lift it, um, <clears throat> let's say 50 times. 50 times at 20 pounds, but then the human body is very consistent so that if this is 40 pounds, I double the weight, then this means that this will be exactly 25. That's the way the human body usually is. I double the weight, therefore this must be exactly half. We're not really like that, right? Um, so it's possible, but probably unlikely that it's a straight line that way. So the most likely result, the most likely way to describe this situation is probably going to be with some sort of a curvy thing. And there, uh, and then uh, T there. Um, wait, is that right? What are we doing? No, oh, W. Wait. Yes, the weight. Okay, so it does make sense that we're going to have some sort of a massive thing there. And then it's going to drop off dramatically, right? Because when it's zero, I could do it like 10,000 times. I mean, I could do it a lot. As soon as you put one pound, that number is going to drop pretty dramatically, right? So it's going to go like that, right? As soon as you throw something on there, it's going to affect it pretty dramatically. And then it's probably going to taper off to something like that and then maybe end somewhere around there. Good? Questions? Does that make more sense? Kind of? Sure. Okay. Um, all right. Not for this. Um, one more thing to mention, I suppose, is uh, that in a case like this, a, uh, a smooth curve doesn't quite make as much sense, right? Because you can't really lift something a decimal number of times. Like, sort of. I don't know. It depends, right? Can I lift it half a time? Half, maybe? Can I lift it 0.1 times? Uh, it's weird, right? So it makes more sense for this to be counting numbers. One, two, three. Like, it's only valid for counting numbers, uh, which would mean that instead of a smooth curve like this, this would just be a bunch of dots that are sort of described by that. But we'll get into that down the road. Okay, good. Questions? Yeah? Okay, moving on. Here's another example. Let A be the average age in years when men first got married and let T be the number of years since 1900. The graph describes the relationship between T and A. So it makes sense that A depends on T, not that T depends on A, right? So, um, you know, think about you're on a you, you invented a time machine and you got in there and you just jumped to some year, but you don't know what year it is. So you stop some random person on the streets and go, hey, what year is it? And they answer, the average age in which men first get married is 23. Uh, what, what year is it again? I don't know. Uh, what does that mean? 
Okay. The other way around, you don't know what year it is, whatever, you don't know anything, but you jump in, you go, hey, uh, do you happen to know at what, what is the average age in which men first get married? And their response is, well, in what year? That's a good question. Oh, are you talking about this year? Are you talking about 1994? Are you talking about, uh, you know, 1950? Right? So, the age at which men first get married depends on the year. Yes? Okay. So we have a nice qualitative graph here. Uh, what can we tell about that dot? What does that blue dot represent? That is, I mean, we don't know the actual number, but what does it represent? In the year 1900. The average age in which men first got married in 1900. So, you know, how do you calculate that? Let's think about that for a second. How would you figure that out? What if I gave you the task to do that? Welcome to my company, you're hired. Go find out the average age at which men first got married in the year 1900. What would you do? <coughs> hmm? Polling? You get in a time machine and go back to 1900? Or you try and find people today that are alive that got married in 1900? I don't know if anybody's you know, gonna be alive. They've been married for 117 years. What else would you do? Okay, records. records, right. You'd go to the records office, you'd look up all the registered marriages for that year, and we're specifically looking for the ones where the man was being married for the first time. There could be cases where the woman is marrying the first time, but it's the male's second or third marriage. That could happen. We're ignoring those. Uh, we're looking at cases where the male is uh, the first marriage for the male. Um, and so we look at all those cases, the males being married for the first time, and then we look at the age at which, you know, so you look up one case, here's a case, here's a couple, it's his first marriage, he's 26. Okay, here's another case, first marriage for the male, he's 17. So you look at all those ages. And then you find the average age, right? The mean age of all those people. That's how you get that answer. So there should be one unique answer for each year. Okay, so uh, the blue dot represents that age. Uh, this book uses a lot of real world data. So this is likely the real answers of what's been happening. Um, so what can you draw from that? What conclusions can you draw from looking at that qualitative graph? It's shaped like a happy face, so marriage is good. No, no, no. Marriage is not good. What? What can you draw? What happens at the beginning? Ages are made younger as time went on. Yeah. As the years progress after 1900, the average age of when men first get married started to decrease. Um, notice that we don't know where that graph ends, right? It's a qualitative graph. I have no idea, I have no idea what this is over here, right? Is this today? Does this represent 2017, 2016, the year 2000? I don't know. So we make some assumptions. I'm going to assume it means, you know, today. But it could be that this is just ranging from the year 1900 to the year 1905. I don't know. Could be. Right, so you have to be real careful when they give you a graph to really be uh, to, to really inspect it and know what they're telling you and what this means and what the scaling is and whatnot. But I'm just going to assume, for the sake of this, uh, that this means today. All right, so if this is today, uh, what years approximately is this center part here? The 50s. Okay, so this is saying like the first half of the century, the average age in which men first got married went down. It hit some sort of bottom. And then the average age at which they first got married started to climb up. Why would that be the case? What happened in the first 50 years of this uh, past century? What events would have driven the average age in which men first got married to, to decrease? World War One and World War Two, and what else happened in the middle between them? Great Depression, right? And does it make sense that those things would have driven the average age in which men first got married down? Yes. Why? Why does war drive the average age in which men first get married 
to decrease. They want to get married before leaving? Why do they want to get married before leaving? In case you die. In case you die. And in case you die, before you leave, you want to... <coughs> Start a family, maybe? Sure. I mean, kind of picture yourself. Can you imagine this? Terrible. Like, World War III just broke out, and you're all getting drafted to go into the war right now. You may never come back. Okay, you might want to have some kids. I don't know. Let's get married. Let's lock this down. Let's have a kid. Um, and, but that's incredibly sexist. It's assuming it's the males going off to war, right? I mean, uh, back in World War One and World War Two, that was largely the case. Uh, but that's that's no longer the case uh, necessarily. But since we're talking about men first getting married, uh, assuming that that uh, you know the significant other is going to stay home. Uh, well, not even that case. I mean, I guess maybe you, even if they're both being shipped off, that might drive them to want to get married. What do you think? If you're two 17-year-olds uh, are a couple and they both got drafted to go into the World War III, do they get married before they head off? They might be going to different places and they may not really see each other. No? 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 All right, um, so that's one thing that's driving it. Uh, what about the depression? How does that drive the average age in which men first get married to go down? We're poor, let's get married. I guess. What's that? They pay less taxes when they're married, so there's some financial tax incentives to get married, sure. Um, there's some financial incentives as far as, you know, sort of living in the same house. Uh, so it might be a little cheaper to, you know, live together uh, than to live by yourself and her by herself in two different rents, right? So it kind of promotes that. Okay, so that kind of describes what was happening in the first 50 years. What happened afterwards? Okay, what, what was happening? What was happening in the world? How come the average age at which men first got married? Parent, we're assuming since 1950, 60-ish. How come that's been going up? Ended, well, the Great War ended, sure. I mean, not that war ended. We've been at war almost every year since, right? It was after World War II. We got the Korean, Korean, Korean War. War. Korean then we had the Vietnam War. The Gulf, War. Gulf War, the first. After Gulf War, Gulf the War. sequel. <laughs> <laughs> Afghan War. Afghan War, right? We're like in two or three wars right now. Um, <laughs> Well, yeah, technically we're in three wars right now, at minimum, because uh, we never ended the Korean War, so we're still technically at war with them. Um, and we got the Afghan and we got the Iraq War, so at least three that I know of, plus who knows what other operations are happening. Yeah, that, that supposedly ended, but I guess it's, you know, from time to time it seems like it's starting to freeze again. Uh, so, who knows. Um, Anyway, uh, so the wars have gone on, but at least the Great War uh, ended. Our economy has done really well, and as we mentioned, when the economy does well, their people aren't too busy uh, going off to war, then they go to college, um, and it's not as common for people to choose to get married while they're in college. Uh, I think it's very common for people to choose to, to wait. Right? Let's get married after. Right? Does anybody know anybody like freshman year? They're both in college freshman year and they decide to get married? No? You know, one couple like in the dorms in, in college that got married. The weirdest why would you do that? <laughs> yeah, they, they got married. They were both in college. Most people the most common response for people to say, hey, we'll just wait till after we graduate and of course we all know they're gonna break up before then. Um, <laughs> It's true, come on. Uh, okay, fine, so then you, you, you waited, and then you graduated, and some people, I guess, get married, but some people choose what instead? Career, right? I gotta, I gotta go get an internship, you know, I don't have time to focus on that, right? I gotta focus on my internship, my career, and then you, you know, put some time into there, and start climbing that corporate ladder, and you start making some money, and now you wanna get married? 
Yeah. You really? You just went through college and all that work to finally get to a good place with a corner office and the big check and the first thing you want to do is cut that check in half? Yeah. I don't think so. Uh, so then maybe you start rethinking life a little bit, right? Um, maybe traveling a little, maybe enjoying that money a little. Um, right, so uh, marriage uh, takes a back seat. Maybe after a while, now you're like in your 30s maybe, and maybe now you decide to get married. Um, kids, do you want to have 13 of them? You're in your 30s, making good money, have a nice career, and now you want to sit down and have 13 kids? Probably not. Um, so, the, there's always exceptions, there's always going to be that couple that is very successful and has a bunch of kids, but the general pattern tends to be that more educated, successful people tend to get married later in life, and they tend to have less kids, right? Often, no kids. Right? They're just too busy, they have too many things to do, and they just don't, don't make that a priority. Um, in general, uh, you know, the opposite is true. You don't go to college, you don't have a successful career, you want to get married and have a bunch of kids. Um, generally the pattern. Always, always exceptions, of course. Anyway, um, uh, the graph tells us, okay, we've already kill that to death. Oh, so the general shape is also parabolic. That's another fancy math word. So it's got this U shape. We also call it a parabolic shape. <clears throat> okay, uh, intercepts, right? So traditionally we think about the Y intercept, the X intercept, but in this, uh, in this book we don't use the letters X and Y as often. We often use different letters, so we got to be careful about which variables we, we are using to describe the independent and dependent variables. So, um, in this case here on the left, the blue dot there is the A intercept because it is the A axis, which is the vertical axis, which is also the dependent uh, variable axis. Okay. Uh, so where the graph crosses that vertical axis is the intercept point. In this case, we're labeling it the A intercept point. In the case on the right, we're using the letters W and T, uh, where W represents the dependent variable, T represents the independent variable. So therefore, where the graph crosses both of those axes, axi, uh, is the intercept point. So the W intercept point, the T intercept point. Pretty straightforward, right? Any questions, 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 questions? No, no? Okay. Here's another example. Uh, let's, see, uh, let's see view the cost in dollars of a 30-second 30 uh, second ad during the Super Bowl at T years since 1987. For most years, the annual increase in cost is more than the previous annual increase in cost. Sketch a qualitative graph uh, to describe the relationship between C and T, okay? So, which one is the dependent and which one is the independent, first of all? Does the year depend on the cost of a 30-second Super Bowl ad? No. Right? You get on that time machine, you jump, you don't know what year you're in, you stop somebody on the streets and go, hey man, what year is it? Uh, about $3 million for 30 seconds. What the hell are you talking about? Uh, right? So, that's weird. On the other hand, if you uh, randomly uh, ask somebody, hey, how much does a 30 second ad cost for the Super Bowl? It would make sense for them to ask you, oh, in what year? You mean this year, 1992, what year? Which Super Bowl? Okay, which Super Bowl? So the uh, cost of a Super Bowl ad depends on the year. So C would go in this direction. So C there and T there, where T is the number of years since 1987. Okay, so now what kind of a graph would describe this? So first of all, does this one make sense? Is that a good graph to describe the, the price of Super Bowl ads? This is saying that they've been decreasing. Now that, that doesn't make any sense at all. They've been going up for sure. Okay. Would that one make sense? Yeah. Yeah? What is that one saying? Yeah. Going up, okay. Um, this is saying that. 
1987, they cost that much, which I don't know how much it is, but I know it's above zero. Is it at all possible, is it possible that it started at zero? No. Possible. Is there any way that a commercial costs zero dollars? No, no, no. Unless it's free. Well, yeah, it's <laughs> cost zero dollars. So it's, no. is there such a thing as a commercial? Have you ever seen a commercial on TV that is up there and whoever put it up there didn't pay any money for it to be up there? Really? Um, you know, Florida was just hit with a hurricane. Please call this number and donate. Emergency broadcast. Okay, there's not emergency broadcast. It's called charity. Sure, it's possible the network in their, you know, uh, generosity and charity decided to give some organization a free commercial. It's possible. Kind of unlikely, but it could happen. Um, particularly if the ratings are terrible, right? I mean, at four in the morning, they're playing some rerun of some sitcom from the 70s. You know, maybe, maybe they, they might be very uh, willing to give away free commercials in those time slots, sure. Okay, so it's possible, um, but probably unlikely. So it's more likely that the price was something in 1987. Uh, 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 so the, the way it's been going up, does it describe that sentence? For most years, the annual increase in cost is more than the previous annual increase in cost. Is that being described by this line? A line is a constant rate of change, right? It means that every year it goes up by the same amount. Right? A constant, consistent. Every year it goes up by $100,000. Every year, every year. So it's a nice straight line. But that's not what that's saying. It's saying most years the annual increase is more than the previous. So would something like this make more sense? Yeah. yeah. So, um, let's, just for the sake of investigating this, let's say that this right here is one year. So this is 19, um, 1987 and then one year later here is uh, 1988 right and then here are the the prices so there's the price but we're talking about the increase in the price. The increase in the price is this part right here right this is the actual price you know seven million dollars for 30 seconds and then the next year, it was $9 million. The increase is this part. Okay, so there's that. So then let's look at the year after that. So then one more year. So this is, uh, you know, second year. Okay, so then that means that this point was 1987. This point is 1988. This point is 1989. And so here's the price for it. Yes, it went, it went up, right, for sure, it went up, but did the rate at which it went up, did that part increase? No. This color is going to look a lot like it. So in other words, the increase is this part. Is the yellow bigger than the red? No. No. So it went up, but it went up by a smaller amount. This graph is describing a situation where the rate of increasing is slowing down, right? Each additional year it goes up, but it goes up by a little less. The biggest, the bulk of the increase happened the first year, and then a little less, and then what's gonna happen the year after that? The third year. Then we're gonna have that, and then we're gonna have, oops, it's supposed to be brown, but it looks a lot like the red. So this which is even smaller than yellow. So we started with this much the first year, then this much, then this much. Right? So it's been going up, but less and less, less and less, less and less. And that's not what they were describing. They're talking about an annual, um, for, each, for most years, the annual increase in cost is more than the previous one. So rather than this picture, how about 
See, okay, so it starts off at some amount. How about something like that? Yeah. Okay, so now it's still going up, but now if we look at the rate of increase, right, so let's, I made it bigger, so let's say that this is one year. Right, so this is 1987, and now this guy right here is 1988. So the increase is this tiny little amount. It went up by that much, that little red part. And then one year after that, let's go over here, that's uh, second year. So now it's going to go up by that amount. So now it's getting bigger, right? So it was this much this year, and then the next year, this is 1987, this is 1988, 1989, uh, and it looks like the increase there is bigger. And if I think about the next year, that third year, now the increase is really big. Now I went up by that much. Think about like rent money, right? Let's say your rent is $1,000 for whatever, just a nice round number. Uh, and then that was your first year, rent. And then the next year, the landlord says, rent's gonna go up by $50. Okay, so now your new rent went up, so now it's $1,050. And then the year after that, they go, oh, rent's gonna go up by $300. Whoa, that's a big increase, so it went up. And then the next year, the rent's gonna be, it's gonna go up by $500. So, in a case like that, every year, not only is it going up, but it's going up by an even higher amount every single year, right? That is different from a case where the first year went up by $300, and then the year after that, it only went up by $100, and the year after that, it only went up by $20. So, in that case, the rate is going up, the, the rent is going up, but the rate at which it's going up is slowing down, right? So, that's the, the difference between the two. Any questions? No? Okay, so I think we've beaten this idea to death. Uh, so here is a case of increasing and decreasing. Um, so this is like the top one, it's increasing, but so is this one. They're both increasing. So how can you tell? Think about a little stick person walking on your graph, on your curve. If the little stick person is walking from left to right the way we read, always from left to right, left to right the way we read, if that little stick person is going uphill, right? if they're going uphill, then the graph is increasing. So they're going uphill there, they're also going uphill there. From left to right the way we read, right? Going up. Except here it's getting, eventually getting slower and slower and slower, right? It was more difficult to climb here, and the climb is getting easier and easier and easier. So the rate at which it's growing, increasing, is slowing down. Whereas here it's the opposite. It started off kind of easy and it's getting harder and harder and harder. So the rate at which it's increasing is increasing, right? But they're both increasing. Now, uh, the bottom one there is decreasing. Again, a little stick person from left to right, the way we read, walking on it would be going downhill. So that would be decreasing. Good? Questions, comments, issues? Notice that the language of whether the curve is increasing or decreasing has nothing to do with the actual numerical values on the curve, meaning it doesn't matter if this curve is here in quadrant one, where this is positive and this is positive, or if that curve is you know over here where you know this way the actual numbers might be negative but the curve itself is increasing Good. Right. so regardless of where the curve is on the grid if a little stick person on it uh, walking on it is going uphill from left to right then we say that the graph is increasing okay any questions any questions any questions 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 questions, questions? Okay, uh, last example. What, what time is this class end? Oh, we're done? Ah. Okay, I'll, I'll go through this really quickly. Uh, suppose that the latest Railhead CD is about to be released. Uh, let N be the number of CDs that will be sold if A dollars are spent on advertising. Sketch a qualitative graph that describes the relationship between A and N. So first of all, which one is the dependent variable? Which one is the independent variable? 
does the amount of money spent on advertising depend on how many people buy their CD? Or does the number of people that buy the CD depend on how much money they spend on advertising? Okay, so advertising money there and there. The number of people that buy it depends on how much money they spend on advertising. Uh, and so, uh, does this make sense? This is saying that if you spend no money on advertising, a bunch of people are going to buy it. And then the more money you spend on advertising, the less people will buy it. Does that make sense ever? I mean, it could be okay. I mean, not, I'm not saying it's relevant to Radiohead, but there could be a case. Can you imagine something out there where uh, when it's sort of mysterious, people, I don't know, buy it? But then as you advertise and let them be aware of it, the more you let them be aware of it, the less they actually like it. It's possible. Like, oh, actually advertising did a bad thing. It was kind of a cool, mysterious thing people were willing to try. But now that they saw the commercial, they're like, yeah, I don't really want, I don't want that. <laughs> it's possible, but that would be bad advertising, right? Um, okay, so typically, hopefully, good advertising will increase it. So, first of all, does this make sense? Can we start there? Go that way? What is this saying? Zero advertising, no one's going to buy it. Is that true? Does that make sense? Yeah. Who's the one person that's always going to buy the, the Radiohead CD? At, at a minimum, parents, right? Mom always buys whatever you make, right? So someone's going to buy it. Someone's going to do it. Friends loved ones, some of them, they have a core fan group also, in this particular case, right? there's a pretty sizable core fan group, they don't need any, ad they don't need a commercial and a billboard, they know, they, they follow this band, they've been waiting for this band to, to release a, a new album, they're eagerly awaiting, they don't need any advertising, some people are going to buy it, even if you spend zero dollars on advertising, so it does make sense that this is going to start off somewhere like that. Okay, um, does this one make sense in this case? The more you spend on advertising, the more people buy it? <clears throat> yeah, that, that makes sense, right? The more you advertise it, the more people buy it. Uh, but what about the rate uh, in which it's growing? Do you think that, let's say that this represents the first, the first $10 million spent on advertising? And so you see this sort of increase right there? And then you spend another ten million dollars. Another ten million dollars. You're like, oh look, we increased even more, right? So we're looking at the rate of increase. The first additional, I mean, the first ten million dollars bought you that many more people that bought the CD. But then you're like, hey, ten million dollars more, and we get even more people. Can you see yourself at that board meeting trying to decide, right? It's going to be released in December. How much should we start spending on advertising right now? I have an idea. Let's spend a hundred million dollars. We'll spend, we'll get even more, right? Apparently, apparently, there's no end here, right? If I spend a billion dollars, I'll get even more people. If I spend 10 billion, let's spend a trillion dollars. We'll just get infinite number of people. Does that make sense? No. First of all, there's a max number of people, right? Just how many people are alive, sure. But also, does it make sense that it grows this way? Don't you think it makes more sense that you would get more bang for your buck at the beginning rather than the end? Uh, so, for instance, um, something that is growing, but it grows a lot at first and then kind of slows down, right? Meaning that the first $10 million The first $10 million that you spend on advertising is going to see a really big, nice, dramatic increase in your sales. Yeah, there's a lot of people that are easily convinced to go ahead and buy it. You know, like, oh, I, didn't, I wasn't paying attention. I, I don't really follow them. I saw a billboard. Okay, I'll try them out. Why not? Right? So that first $10 million might buy you a lot. 
But eventually, down the road, even if you spend another $10 million over there, you know, people, at some point, people just don't care, right? So here's the next $10 million, right? Okay, so now you're still going to see an increase, perhaps, but that increase is likely going to be a little smaller. It's getting harder to convince people, right? More ads, more billboards, more commercials, more everything. It's getting harder and harder to convince those other people to go out and buy it. And let's look at the next $10 million. Now you're spending a ton of money. So now you're at $30 million in the advertising pot. And now, you know, even less people. People that, people that were interested have already seen, uh, they're already downloaded. So now you're getting less money. Eventually it gets to the point where you spend you know, a hundred million, two hundred million, you spend so much money and you're really not getting anything left because people that wanted to have already bought it. Everybody else just doesn't care, right? I don't care how many commercials or how much email I get. I just don't care about that bad. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna download, right? Good? Makes sense? Okay, so this one makes more sense than this one in this particular case. Good, good, good. All right.